I want to welcome everybody to this event. Those of you that are here, those of you that are uh, virtually attending, we have a super great next two days. Um, how many of you liked Ron that are here, liked Ron the flashlight dancer? I wonder whether Ron started off in a small high school auditorium in Peoria and somebody said, dude, you got to be in Vegas, man. <laughs> he is the best. We have Ron every year. We're all back there. Is Ron going yet? Is Ron going yet? So listen, I have um, just some minor goals for this opening session. I want to talk about why we have silos, why they need busted, what comes next, and how to get started in the next 29 minutes and two seconds. And I want to start by something, sharing something with you that I read last week. I find it very interesting. You know why I find that interesting? It is completely wrong. We are so far away from figuring out a high growth, high profit SaaS model. We have so much to go do. Fortunately, there are more level-headed people in the world who say other things that I really super agree with intellectually, right? And so here is what I have to say about where we are right now. Our operating models in our companies are so complex that nobody can effectively consume them. Customers can't consume them, partners can't consume them, even employees struggle to consume them. And when you think about these silos, you know, we, we have so many silos inside our business. We're generous, I'm, I think we're being generous to just point out four, but it's not really like it's just four. This morning, where are my good friends from Cisco? Yeah, okay, good. I'm gonna come over and talk to you for a second. So this morning, I went on the Cisco website and I went under executive bios, okay? And I counted the number of senior vice presidents, executive vice presidents, corporate vice presidents on the Cisco website. And I presume each one of those has an organization, right? Do you know how many there are? Anybody know at Cisco? What do you guys think, 30, 40, 91? 91 senior vice presidents and above, okay? How does anybody consume an organization that has 91 separate pieces? Our customers go on this wild ride through the silos. It starts in the sales process. They have to go up the sales silo, right? And work through the, all that complexity. And then they come down, and now they've signed an agreement. And then they go up the professional services silo and work with the silo people in that organization, and then they're ready to go live. And then they go up the customer success silo and work through all their new friends in customer success. And then they start having technical issues, and they go up the support silo and come back down and all the individual people and systems and processes and behaviors and then when they need something else they go all the way back and start all over again not only not only is that hard on the customer it is super expensive 91 senior vice presidents and above. And I guarantee you that each one of those senior vice presidents 
has a finance person and an, a, an IT person and an HR person, and it goes on and on and on, right? Duplicated, 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 duplicated across all of these silos. So can I get an amen that all of these silos in our business Can I get an amen to that? So I've been thinking for a long time, and I shared this in Orlando um, at our spring Interact conference, that, that, and I've been in this industry uh, since 1983. I'm embarrassed to say that, but I have been. And I've worked with the largest, most successful companies in the history of tech. And I would argue that the management of tech company really has sort of four points on a compass that they can direct the company to head in. They can focus on revenue growth, or they can focus on cost containment. They can focus on product, or they can focus on customer experience. Now, in a perfect world, in a perfect world, our companies would be able to go in all four directions at one time. Not so much. We have tendencies. We're much happier when the top managing a business where the top line is growing, 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 than we are a business where we've got to cut costs, cut costs, cut costs. We love growth. We're the tech industry. But it's not just that. We're much more comfortable having product, product be the driving force of the company and innovating product than innovating the customer experience. We like to go northwest. We like to focus on product innovation and high revenue growth. And we know the plays to run in that part of the compass. We know how to manage businesses when it's high growth and our products are in wild demand. And two silos always took the lead, engineering and sales. And that was okay. It is okay when the economy is incredibly favorable, customers have big wallets open and ready to roll, if you're a, a, a private equity or venture-backed SaaS startup, there's abundant capital, more capital waiting to come in and support the growth of the company and any losses that you may have along the way. So when the winds are favorable, these models, these plays make perfect sense. But more recently, we've had a less favorable economy and capital has become more expensive. Now, it's a very interesting discussion about which of these two eras is actually normal. Is the normal state super great economy and very cheap capital? Is the normal state a more challenged economy and more expensive capital, higher interest rates, or somewhere in between? But the reality is that the old plays don't work so well in this economic environment. And so what was our first reaction? Just cut the size of the old plays. We're going to restructure sales a little bit to try to drive down some of that cost, right? We're going to do other things to sort of take the traditional investments, the plays, and really bring them down sort of across the board. And I'm going to argue, we're going to argue, that that's actually not the answer. The answer is that we need to design new plays that can simultaneously innovate the customer experience and reduce the cost of operating your business, right? So what are some of those plays? I promise you, over the next few days, you're going to hear some themes. One theme, simplifying portfolios, right? Uh, how many SKUs does your company have across the product and service portfolio? 
It's unbelievable, right? So you're going to be hearing about companies who are simplifying, rationalizing, converging portfolios to make it easier for customers, easier for salespeople, easier for partners to consume the portfolio. You're going to hear about simplifying and combining organizational structures, silo busting, right? Very importantly, you're going to hear about unifying systems and data. Systems and data. And in a very sort of exciting change over the course of the last year, you're going to be hearing a lot about AI-driven digital customer engagement capabilities. Now, I told you that I was going to say sort of why we have the silos, because we grew up in a world where our products dominated our market, the economy was great, and so we just organized in silos because it was the way we all knew how to do it. So now things are a little bit different. And I want to make a prediction of where we may be headed over the next one, three, four years. Not 10, 20, 30, one, three, four. Because I believe the changes are in the air. That concepts and tools are emerging for new and better ways for us to organize and run our company. And so, it's time to bust the silos. How do we do that? Well, I'm about to submit to you that it's going to start as a data project inside your company. It's going to start as a data project. The second thing that's going to happen is that you're going to start to learn how to apply AI to make decisions about what customer engagement activity to run, plays, if you will. What play to run based on the data that we have about the customer. And that that notion of these plays is going to force us to rethink the organizing principles of the company and move it away from P&Ls and move it toward customer journeys. Okay? Let me talk some more about that. Now, I want to take one step back and tell you how we got to this notion that this has to get done. I want you to take a second and read that slide. Okay? Everybody got that? Do you know when we published that slide? 2009. 2009. And we have watched, we have said that to CEOs and senior executives, and everybody shakes their head. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And we have watched your companies execute, and it has not been pretty. It has not been pretty, right? The silos begin to erupt, right? This doesn't fit with our silos thinking, or our silos financial goals, or our silos whatever, and we didn't get it done. We're still here 14 years later saying that that statement is true and we have not been able to pull it off because of the limitations of the silos. Now, um, have any of you ever seen one of these customer journey maps for an enterprise customer? Have you ever seen them, these customer journey maps? They look like they should be on the whiteboard at SpaceX. Right? They are just these insanely complicated diagrams of, you know, all of the issues and touch points and processes and s systems and all these things that an enterprise customer has to go through in one life cycle. So I'm going to ask you to clear your mind of that. Clear your mind of that. Because I'm going to assert that there's a new image, a single image, 
that we need to have inside of our companies about the customer life cycle. And it's this image. The customer life cycle at its most fundamental level is about the fact that we need information from the customer to be able to deliver the value of our project, our product, and they need information about us and our products to realize the potential value that could be delivered. So they need information from us, we need information from them. Do you know what you call that process inside your company? Marketing, sales, support, success. You have people all across the life cycle of the customer designed to get information. You have systems designed to get information. You're spending, we are spending tons and tons and tons of money to collect the information that we need from the customer and to give them the information they need about us. That thought, that thought, that it, this organizational structure and solving the organizational structure is not the right problem to focus on, it's a data problem. It is a data and information problem. In the old world, every silo was busy collecting the data it needed to function. Sales collected its data. Customer, select, customer success had to gather its data. But what would happen if all of a sudden information that was really going to benefit customer success was actively and regularly collected in the sales process? Let me give you a good example. Onboarding. We know how important onboarding is to the customer journey, right? In pre-sales, all the right people are at the table from the customer side. We are learning all the organizations and the users and collecting all this information about who's going to be using the product and why and what they're trying to go do. And how often does sales write all that information down? How often does sales say, hey, give me everybody's email address in this meeting because I want to give it to your customer success manager because you are the people that need to be involved in onboarding and, you know, it almost never happens. Why doesn't it happen? It doesn't happen because it takes work. It takes effort. It takes a different way of thinking about the problem. Instead of saying, I don't need this data to get the sale closed, they should be thinking the organization needs this data about the customer and in order to be able to function more efficiently somewhere else in the life cycle. Let me give you the flip side. What if customer success was super diligent about keeping current on the business initiatives that are driving the customers? What new things are they trying to achieve? What new investments are they thinking about making? Keeping that information current so that we could direct sales to somebody who we know what they're trying to do, we know it lines up with our value proposition, we know who the players are, and we can super efficiently target the salespeople because we have the data about the customer, the right data about the customer. The problem is, it costs money. It takes time, right? And if all we're worried about is our p &L, right, and the beneficiary of this activity, this data collection activity, is not in our p &L, it's in somebody else's p &L, we don't really want to spend the time and effort to go do it because we get Actually, we get docked for that, right? We get docked for spending more money, right? So I believe that a unified data project can start the convergence process. We, you, have tons of data, 
The question is, do you have the right data? Do you have the right data? I stood on this stage pre-COVID with a room like this, and I asked a simple question. If I opened up your CRM systems that sales uses every day, and I opened up a closed one opportunity, would I find written down somewhere in that opportunity record the business outcomes that the customer was trying to achieve as a reason for them to buy our product? You know how many hands went up in this room when I asked? Zero. Zero. And I remember I went like this. Like, really? We go through this entire process, we have all these discussions with the customer, and we don't document it, so that when the PS people walk in the door, they walk into the customer, they go, okay, what are we doing here? And the customer's like, I just spent nine months telling you what the hell we're doing here, right? Same thing with the customer success people. We pick it up, pick up the opportunity, you know, go to meet the CSM, and the CSM's like, okay, what are we trying to do here? The fact of the matter is, if we had the data that we need, and we figured out where in the life cycle was the naturally best place to collect that data, that would change everything. Because that data is going to trigger a set of plays that are going to help us achieve an objective or our customers achieve an objective. That data, if you haven't seen this chart, this is a whole chapter in our latest book um, called Digital Hesitation, where we took the layer model, land, adopt, expand, renew, and we gave it a facelift, an update, and it's now called A player. A is for analyze the data. B is for placing the right resource to go take the next step, take the customer on the next step in the journey across landing, adopting, expanding, and renewing. And I'm super happy to tell you that the emergence of AI is going to make this so powerful and much easier to do. If we look at a particular customer and we look at the data that we've collected about that customer and it says they're ready for an expansion and they want to go in to sort of this direction, then we can get the right salesperson and the right solution architect and we can have the CSM introduce them. Think about that. The CSM introduce them, right? And that's a play. That's a play that the data told us to run. And that play doesn't just involve one quote silo, it involves resources from multiple silos. And our AI can say, hey, based on that data for that customer, here's the right play to run. And oh, by the way, don't forget to go back and tell your AI tools whether the play worked. Seriously, right? Did that play work? If not, change the play and run it on the next customer. And go back and tell the AI whether that worked. A data-driven customer engagement model designed to launch plays across multiple functions in the organization is where we're headed. That is where we are headed. And you are going to hear over the course of the next few days so many bits and pieces of this coming to life. Company, what companies are doing, they're going through, they're trying to get the data together, figuring out what data they have, what data they're missing, where that data sits, identifying the plays that could be run, experimenting with the AI tools that could be brought in to make these plays super efficient. It's coming. And it's going to be super impactful and it's going to start right now. Okay, so do we have to have silos? Maybe. But do we really need that many? What if we just had three? Those three that were lined up to the major journeys 
that our customers have to go on. We said many, many years ago that the other side of layer, the other side of that coin, because you can't go to a customer and say, I'm going to land you, I'm going to expand you. I mean, you could. They already know, by the way, right? But instead, we said, hey, go talk to them about their journey, which we called PIMO, plan, implement, monitor, optimize, okay? Let's cut it from four to three. The planning journey that we and our customers have to go on. And by the way, sales sits in there. Okay? The planning journey. The implementation journey. And the optimization journey. So what might be in that optimization journey team? That optimization journey team? Customer success. Customer support, field services, a sliver of education, right? A sliver of solution architecture and architecture management, right? So instead of having 91, right, maybe we can get down to five or four or three. So I'm going to submit that the next generation of organizational structures starts as a data project, and you're going to hear so many companies that have started their data project. We're going to realize that we can use AI to guide the official, efficient deployment of resources across siloed boundaries, that we're going to land up as a result of that, saying, look, these teams, these people are working together so often, maybe they should be part of a single organization that will result in fewer, broader silos, broader organizations in your company that are heavily interconnected. Heavily interconnected. Because the data we need, there is a natural place in the customer life cycle to collect that data, a best place. And it may not be in the same organization that needs the data. So what is going to win the day is the agreement to work on the data problem. So what if, what if you can't all of a sudden walk in and say to the CEO, I saw this great presentation, we're breaking all the silos, we're going to reorganize, I got this. <laughs> but what you could do is to go inside your own silo and ask a few questions. What is the data, the customer data, that we really need to operate most efficiently? What is that data? If we had perfect knowledge of the customer, what would be in our databases? Secondly, where in the life cycle is the natural point, the best point to collect that data? The third step is to say, what data do we collect that could be super valuable to another part of the company? And go find those people and say, hey, are you willing to do a handshake? I really need you to start collecting this data, and that'll help me a lot. And oh, by the way, I'm willing to start collecting this data that I think would help you a lot. Everybody in this room has the ability to go get your organization to do a project like this. Now, I wish it was a corporate-wide project and so forth, but it will get you there. But you gotta start. You gotta start. And fortunately, AI is coming along to help us make that easier, faster, better, this is where we're headed. We're headed to a different way of thinking about the customer life cycle that's based on data and cross-functional plays driven by AI. Now, you're going to hear about other things in the next few days. You're going to hear about converging our offers, our product and service offers, instead of thinking about them as two completely separate things, bringing them together. You're going to hear about 
a single digital experience. Not every silo having it building its own digital experience, but a unified digital experience that takes customers digitally through the life cycle. You're going to hear about converging service delivery silos to create blended offers and blended capabilities. You're going to hear about having tighter linkages between post and pre-sales in order to drive renewals and small expansions in the most cost-effective ways. Those are just a few of the hundreds of journeys you're going to hear about over the next two days. It's going to be a wild ride. It is going to be a wild ride. And so we decided that you guys, we should probably give you some intellectual and emotional coaching and counseling because you're going to run into all these problems, right? You're going to run into culture problems, incentive problems, priority problems, people who don't want to give up their power base. None of those are good enough reasons not to go do this. None of those are good enough reasons not to dramatically improve the customer experience. None of those are good enough reasons not to potentially help you increase the productivity employees by 40%, 50%, 60%. None of those things can stand, but they're an important thing to acknowledge. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to silo bust. So I'm here to tell you changes in the air, the concept and tools are emerging for new and better ways of operating, of running innovative customer experiences that can improve our market share, improve our profitability, and lower our cost. You ready to get to it? Okay, thank you very much.